During the Soviet Union, strength and conditioning went through a renaissance. They applied a highly systematic and scientific approach to sports training, including in boxing, not only for the technical aspects and the psychological aspects, but also the strength and conditioning related aspects. In fact, they were so highly refined that we even use their scrap pieces for the physical preparations of athletes today. So imagine you have a nation where the development of athletes is state-sponsored. So they want to train and recruit the best minds in all of sports science, the best professors, the best sports scientists, and gather them in one place to train all of these athletes with one goal in mind. Show the Soviet Union in high regard and display its superiority in the Olympic Games. The Soviets were perhaps the first that combined elements from different sports into boxing, including the Olympic weightlifting variations and the plyometrics from the track and field, all in order to train or enhance the physical capacities of boxers to their maximal potential. Concepts such as plyometrics, the stretch shortening cycle, periodization, things of this nature, it all began with the rigorous Soviet research. This was truly the peak, the renaissance period of strength and conditioning for sports performance. Everything was scientific, calculated and measured. They combined the sports scientists that stayed along the athletes in their training sessions and monitored their training because the nation's reputation was on the line here. So there was a lot of money, a lot of resources invested. All of this led to a dramatic peak in sports science during this period. Today, however, in the post-Cold War era, the development in sports science has subsided a little bit because national pride is not tied to it anymore and not as much money is invested in it, so the development is relatively steady right now. To a very large extent, even modern sports science, we are simply using the scrap pieces that the Soviets produced during this period. And dare I even say that in some boxing facilities, they are even losing their quality. All of this scientific work that the Soviets produced, which is abundant, there is a lot of information on it, people are still trying to reinvent the wheel and use methods that are not scientifically verified. Why do this to yourself? If you had a nation that spent millions of dollars, recruited the best minds of sports science and produced such rich information, scientifically verified information that simply works, why are some boxing facilities disregarding these? Why are they falling for gimmicks? I do not understand that. Perhaps it is a matter of traditionalism or they don't know that this information exists or they don't know the value behind it. The questions are many. I'm not gonna go into that, but... If you're watching this video right now, if you're listening to this, if you implement these Soviet training methods, if you read the articles, you know, you don't overcomplicate the process, you use standard strength training, ballistic training, plyometric training, and even Olympic weightlifting variations, you are far ahead of the curve. Here is an example of plyometric training that they used, which is short contact times, using the elastic properties of your muscles and... A lot of people don't know it, but punching power, a lot of it comes from the legs. You need a lot of explosive power and twitch in the legs. And the Soviets were the first ones to start using plyometric training for preparation of athletes in different sports outside of track and field. And this was pioneered by a sports scientist called Yuri Veroshansky. They did a lot of ballistic training, resisted punching variations, landmine variations, and above all, as you can see, maximal mental intent on every repetition. When you train for explosive power, it's all about producing as much force as you can in the fastest amount of time possible. That is power for you, force multiplied by velocity. And this is a mental quality that needs a sort of mental training because power starts with a thought after all. It travels through the spinal cord into the muscles. They even implemented elements from gymnastics into boxing training. And you might wonder what the hell does gymnastic training have to do with boxing? What does Olympic weightlifting have to do with boxing or plyometrics? There is a reason why almost every single world-class athlete, whether we're talking about boxing or wrestling or MMA, whatever, during their childhood, they had a wide selection of sports that they participated in. So they had a very rich movement competency that they got from each of these sports. So they were very prepared when they decided to specialize later. And a very big, I don't like the word secret, but a very big component of the Soviet system's success is that they had the right person for the right place. 
Today, for example, mainly due to economical reasons, you have one single coach trying to take too many roles. You have one boxing coach that does the endurance training, the boxing technical training, the boxing strength and power training, whatever, in this kind of awkward hybrid manner and nothing is really specialized you become like sort of a it becomes a scattered approach where you do a mediocre job on every single component but the soviet system they recruited the right brains for the right task for the power development they had someone specialized in plyometrics and olympic weightlifting and all of that for the boxing training the technical aspects they had a specialized boxing coach for that for example vasil filiminov who has produced tons of rich content on boxing biomechanics you know energy transfer from one leg to another things of this nature they had psychologists they had nutritionists they had the right person at the right place this is a major component when it comes to sports development